Hello, today we're going to be talking about nuclear chemistry. And so today, as we're talking about nuclear chemistry, we're going to try to understand what happens to the atom in nuclear chemistry and help us to understand what nuclear decay is and how it, dangerous it is and, and essentially the different types of nuclear radiation that there is. So let's jump into it, All right? Nuclear radiation was first discovered by Henry Becquerel back a little bit before 1900, and it was Marie Curie who discovered um, that it was actually affecting the atoms themselves. Now, Ernest Rutherford did a very interesting experiment. All right, He took some uranium, which was known to produce nuclear radiation, and he stuck it in a lead block. All right, So right there. So you got some uranium right there. And the lead block was basically used to block as much of that nuclear radiation as possible. And so that all it did was come out through this hole. And so then he had another sheet of lead with a very, very small hole there. So he had a nice, fine uh, beam of nuclear radiation. And then he passed it through an electric field. And he also tried passing it through a magnetic field. And in both instances, he was able to separate that beam of nuclear radiation actually into three different beams. And he saw that those three different beams were affected differently by the electric or magnetic fields. He was able to see this through by using a photographic plate. So essentially, the nuclear radiation can actually expose a photographic plate just like light can, right? And so well, what do you think we can tell about those three different types of nuclear radiation? Well, one of them was attracted to a negative charge, and a, another one was attracted to a positive charge. So he hypothesized that these, or this beam, is made out of negatively charged particles because negatively charged particles are attracted to positive. And this beam here was, was composed of positively charged particles because it was attracted to this negatively charged plate, right? And so he gave them names, he called them alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles being the ones that were positively charged and beta being the ones that were negatively charged. And eventually they found out that alpha particles are not something incredibly new, but they're actually composed of two protons and two neutrons. And so the protons give it the positive charge and the neutrons give it some more mass. And so your alpha particles really are essentially exactly the same as your ordinary helium nuclei. So when you say it's helium nuclei, it's not including any electrons at all, just two protons and two neutrons. And those are positively charged. They have a plus two charge because they have two protons. And that's why your alpha particles are attracted to the negative plate. Now, beta particles later were found to actually simply be electrons, all right? They're very high energy electrons. And electrons, negatively charged, are attracted to a positive plate. Now, notice that these electrons or these beta particles are actually moved more than the alpha particles. And the reason for that simply is because the electrons are much, much lighter and lighter particles are able to be moved more than your alpha particles, which are going to have more momentum and are going to be affected less by that um, attraction to this negative charge. Okay. Now, gamma rays are not affected at all. So they're composed of some kind of chargeless particle or some kind of chargeless beam. So there's no charge to the, the gamma beam at all. And is determined later on that, that gamma rays are actually just simply electromagnetic radiation. Um, and we sing that in our electromagnetic radiation song, right? So um, starting with radio waves going all the way to gamma rays, gamma rays being the um, highest energy electromagnetic radiation. All right. Now, these different types of nuclear radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, can be distinguished First of all, through the way that they interact with a, an electric field, and secondly, through their penetrating ability, okay? So they have different penetrating ability. Your alpha particles are actually able to be stopped by a sheet of paper or your skin. They're not gonna penetrate through your skin. So when alpha radiation is outside of your body, it's not gonna be very dangerous, all right? Beta particles are able to pierce your skin. Um, they're able to go through a sheet of paper and they're essentially a hundred times more penetrating than alpha particles. Your beta particles um, can be stopped by a sheet of metal. Gamma particles, on the other hand, can go all the way through your body, straight through your body. Nothing's gonna stop them. Well, not nothing. They can be stopped by a thick sheet of lead and so, or other kinds of 
um, heavy metals or heavy elements can stop them if you have a thick sheet of the material. Or you can have, let's say, you know, 10 feet of concrete or something like that. So gamma particles need quite a bit to stop them or shield them. Okay, so alpha particles, um, the, the least penetrating beta about 100 times more and gamma are going to be 100 times more than beta or 10,000 times as penetrating as alpha. Now, nuclear radiation is quite dangerous to the human body, right? So it has a very high amount of energy. What, what does it do to your body? The, the main thing that it's going to be doing is it can ionize atoms. Ionize basically means it's going to rip out the electrons from the atoms. And in the process, it's going to break bonds. Well, your body is made out of a whole bunch of covalent compounds. So if you break the bonds in these covalent compounds, if you do it enough, it's going to lead to your cells dying, which could lead to your organs dying, which could lead to you dying. And that's what happens if you have a large amount of nuclear radiation. Or possibly if you have a small amount of nuclear radiation, uh, doses that are not enough to actually kill you or kill the cells, you can actually change the DNA and you're going to end up with DNA mutations in your body. Now, that might be harmless or it could actually cause cancer in the future. So um, nuclear radiation, large amounts can kill you through organ death or small amounts can possibly lead to cancer. So very, very dangerous. All right. Now, um, this ionizing, so essentially this ability to break bonds and ionize atoms, that's called the ionizing ability of nuclear radiation. And your alpha, beta, and gamma, their ionizing ability is actually the exact opposite of their penetrating ability. So alpha particles have the highest by far ionizing ability. What does that mean? Essentially, one alpha particle, as it goes through space and bumps into things, will cause a lot of atoms to be ionized or a lot of bonds to be broken. So it's not that one alpha particle is going to break one bond. No, actually, one alpha particle is going to break a whole bunch of bonds before it finally slows down and turns into a, a helium. Now, the beta particle is going to have a, a, medium, a medium ionizing ability. So, you know, one beta particle might cause a few different ionizing um, as it's traveling, and gamma is going to be low. So it's not going to cause as many ionizing events or bonds breaking as it travels through space. So um, backing up here, that's going to mean that alpha particles are going to be the safest ones when they're outside your body because alpha particles can't possibly penetrate your skin. However, if you somehow get alpha particles inside your body, whether it's through ingesting or swallowing or breathing in some sort of alpha particle emitter, um, once it gets in your body, it's going to be extremely, extremely poisonous and it's going to be extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, one it would, example of this would be polonium. Sometimes people, um, if, if they ingest a small amount of polonium, that's going to be extremely poisonous to them. They're alpha emitters. Okay. All right. So before we go on and talk about how these things actually work when they break down through nuclear decay, um, let's repeat and kind of go over what these things look like. So you recall that we've talked about the meaning of this and this, all right? This six down here for carbon, that is known as the atomic number, right? The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus, all right? It's the nuclear charge, the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, we're going to think of it more in terms of a nuclear charge because sometimes we're actually going to use this number down here as a charge number rather than simply the number of protons, okay? So this is the nuclear charge here for whatever particle you're talking about. The 12 up here for carbon-12, that's going to be your mass number, which is the number of protons plus neutrons, which means, of course, carbon, in this case, has six protons. We can tell here it's got six protons. And because this is 12 here, and 12 minus 6 is 6, that would mean that carbon has six protons and six neutrons. Okay? So on to your alpha radiation. Well, what is alpha radiation? Well, we've already said that alpha radiation is essentially two protons and two neutrons. And so you can write your alpha radiation as simply a, a helium, so HE, like this. And we're going to do that typically. So this thing right here, this is an alpha particle that's being given off. 
All right. And so alpha radiation occurs when some particular nucleus is just too heavy to be stable. So uranium-238, this is uranium-238. We call it by um, the element's name, which is uranium, and then 238, which is the mass number. So uranium-238 is unstable, and it will split into thorium-234 and an alpha particle. And in doing that, when it gives off this alpha particle, it becomes more stable because it loses some of its mass. Elements don't want to be that heavy. All right. Now, notice that in this nuclear reaction, so we are changing one element to another element, but also notice that in every single nuclear reaction that we write, the atomic number must be balanced and the mass number must be balanced. Well, what do I mean by that? We have 92 on the bottom, right? So 92 here, which means it has 92 protons. Well, that 92 equals what? It equals 90 plus 2. And that's always true, not just for alpha radiation, but for any kind of nuclear radiation, you're going to find that always your atomic number must be balanced, the same on both sides. All right, let's look. This, the mass number is the same too, okay? So we have uranium-238 starts as 238 up here, right? And then it turns into 234 plus 4, right? 234 plus 4 equals 238. And so both the atomic number and the mass number need to be balanced. And that's the way that we're going to solve these kinds of nuclear reactions. All of them are going to be solved simply by balancing the atomic number and the mass number. Now, let's try to solve a sample problem here. We have bismuth-190. It undergoes alpha decay. What nuclide is produced? And the way we're going to solve that is the very first thing you're going to need to do is to look up bismuth on your periodic table. All right, so bismuth-190. Let's see if we can look that up. All right. And when we look up bismuth-190, we are going to find it right here, right? So bismuth 190 on your periodic table. So bismuth is element number 83, right? Element number 83 is bismuth, okay? And so you're going to come back over here, and then we're going to say, all right, um, we're going to write down your bismuth here with your 83 that you found on the periodic table and your 190 that you know that you have, right? It's going to give off an alpha particle. So we're going to write our alpha particle right over here, all right? It's something plus an alpha particle. And then when we figure out, okay, what's going to be produced, well, what do you figure out? Well, we say 83 equals what plus 2? Well, 83 equals 81 plus 2, okay? And then 81, you think to yourself, okay, 81, I don't remember what element that is. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to look over here and find element number 81. So that's TL, thallium. So element 81 is thallium. So we're going to come back over here and we will write down thallium right here, okay? And also you need to figure out what the mass number is. And we say, okay, what plus four is 190, okay? 186 plus four is 190. And so that's how we're able to figure out our, um, our numbers there, okay? All right, so that's alpha decay. Beta decay or beta radiation is essentially happens when there are too many neutrons in the nucleus. And that becomes, the, the nucleus becomes unstable when there's too many neutrons and it needs to get rid of the, those neutrons somehow. So it can get rid of a neutron by literally taking one of its neutrons and turning it into a proton and a high energy electron. Yes. A neutron is literally changing into a proton, right? So a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. And if you'll notice that the charge is completely balanced when it does that, right? Because uh, a neutron has a neutral charge. A proton has what is a positive one charge. An electron is a negative one charge. And positive one and negative one is neutral or a neutron no charge at all. So a neutron can actually turn into a proton and an electron. And when it does that, well, what happens to the nucleus? Well, the nucleus is going to get an extra, um, an extra proton and it's going to lose a neutron. 
And so you expect the mass number not to change, which is exactly what happens here, right? The mass number here is going from 131 to 131 because you're not changing your total number of protons and neutrons. All you're doing is taking a neutron and turning it into a proton. And so if you're gaining a proton, you'd expect an increase in your atomic number, which is exactly what you see, right? It's going from 53 to 54, it's increasing, okay? So notice that any time you have beta radiation, you have actually an increase in your atomic number, okay? So your beta particle, we write like this. Now you could write it with a beta symbol, but typically instead of doing that, we're gonna write it like this. So we're gonna write a beta particle as an E. And remember, E stands for electron, and electrons, I know electrons don't have zero mass, okay? But the mass of electron is so much smaller, right? It's about one two thousandth of the mass of a proton or a neutron. And so we're essentially gonna write the, the mass number of a, an electron is zero, okay? And its atomic number or nuclear charge is negative one. Now remember now this thing down here in the bottom left is not simply gonna be the number of protons, but it's gonna be the charge of that or the nuclear charge, the particle charge, okay? And so that's gonna be negative one for the electron. And so we're gonna notice that 53 equals 54 minus one, right? So 54 minus one is 53. So the charge is balanced or the nuclear charge is balanced on both sides. And then we have 131 equals 131 plus zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and try a practice problem. Phosphorus 32 undergoes beta decay. What nuclide is produced? Now we know phosphorus is element number 15. Okay, so phosphorus is element number 15. And when it undergoes beta decay, what happens? So it gives off a, a beta particle, gives off an electron, but in the process, one of these neutrons is going to be turned into a proton. So we need, we say, okay, what minus one is 15? Well, the answer is 16. So element number 16, okay? And element number 16, and we'll, let's go ahead and talk about the mass number first. Um, so what plus zero is 32? Of course, 32 plus zero is 32. Okay, so it's going to be element number 16 and 32. Well, that's sulfur. Okay, so element number 16 is sulfur and it has a mass number of 32 because that's not going to change during beta decay. All that's going to happen is a neutron is going to turn into a proton and the element's going to split, spit out a high energy electron. And that high energy electron, which is going to be traveling close to the speed of light, very close to the speed of light, moving very quickly, and that high energy electron is going to be an ionizing particle. And so we call that beta radiation. Okay. Gamma radiation is actually not just a thing all by itself, but gamma radiation occurs um, typically with other sorts of nuclear decay. So it can occur with alpha decay, it can occur with beta decay, um, or it can occur with other things like positron emission, which um, we'll get to later. All right, so it's going to accompany other sorts of nuclear decay, all right? And typically, we're not going to need to write it down. So you, you see that your, your gamma right here, zero, zero, because gamma is simply electromagnetic radiation. It's a photon, it has zero rest mass, it has zero charge. And typically, we're not even going to bother write it, writing it down. You just need to recognize that sometimes gamma radiation also occurs but you don't need to write down that it occurs, okay? And so in this case, lead, um, lead 214 is giving off a beta particle and is also giving off some gamma radiation as it converts into bismuth 214. All right, now you might wonder, how can we detect nuclear radiation? Because it's pretty important that we are able to detect it. And we've already figured out one way to detect it. We've already talked about it, right? Through uh, a photographic plate and we can, apply that technology to a wearable technology, which is what they do. Let's say if you work at a nuclear power plant, or let's say you work at a nuclear weapons facility or something like that, you're going to wear one of these badges. And these badges basically tell you whether you've been exposed to nuclear radiation that has hurt you or not. All right. So it's sort of an after the fact kind of thing, um, but it's, it's pretty important to, so you can know what you need to do. Okay. So what is it? You've got some, essentially, this is just some kind of photographic material here. So some kind of material that would 
interact with light or it would interact with your um, any kind of nuclear radiation. All right, so they're going to cover it up so it's not you know exposed to light. And what happens is over time, this is going to change colors if you're exposed to nuclear radiation, right? And they have over here kind of some a color code to tell you how serious of a condition that you have been exposed to, right? So if it remains as white, well, you're good to go. There's no kind of nuclear radiation. But if it turns, let's say this color, man, you've just been exposed to a lot of nuclear radiation and they're going to spray you down and scrub you with Brillo pads and all kinds of crazy stuff to get that nuclear radiation as much as possible off you. All right. Another way that nuclear radiation is detected and probably the most um, famous one is known as the Geiger counter. Now the Geiger counter looks pretty complex, but it basically just goes on the, the whole principle of ionizing radiation. So alpha, beta, gamma, and other forms of nuclear radiation will be ionizing in that they will make, they will strip electrons off of various different atoms. And so what you, you, you do in this um, Geiger counter is you have a whole bunch of argon gas. Argon gas is a noble gas. It doesn't really interact with other things very much. But let's suppose there's some gamma rays or some beta rays or something like that that um, are around there. So this gamma ray can go into the Geiger counter and can hit any one of the argon gas molecule or argon gas atoms that are inside, and that's going to knock out an electron. When that happens, all of a sudden argon becomes positively charged because it's lost an electron. Plus there's an electron now moving around. So that now is able to conduct electricity. So we have essentially a, an electric circuit here that if there's any kind of charged particle in there, now that charged particle can, those charged particles, the electron can go on one side and the argon can go to the other side. And so you can have a small amount of conduction of electricity for every single ionizing event, okay? If there's no ionizing event, you have no conduction of electricity. The more ionizing events that occur inside this, the more conduction of electricity that you can have, okay? And so that's how a Geiger counter works. A cloud chamber is really, really cool, not as practical as a Geiger counter or a film badge, but it's really, really cool because it enables you to visualize with your naked eye, you know, what these different nuclear radiation um, is, is doing, okay? And so what you can do is you can set this up a, a number of different ways, but typically you can just take, let's say a little Petri dish like you have here. And in the Petri dish, you can put some kind of alcohol, like rubbing alcohol or ethyl alcohol or something like that, and some dry ice. And so what will happen is the um, this little Petri dish or cloud chamber will become filled with or saturated with your alcohol. And it'll be so cold when you put the, the dry ice in there that it'll be super saturated and wanting to condense whatever that alcohol is in the air. All right, but because it's so cold, it's not able to condense very easily. So what happens is when any kind of nuclear radiation goes through the air, when it bumps into different things, that energy enables it to now solidify and you get these trails, right? Kind of like contrails or something like that. And so you get these trails of nuclear radiation, which is caused by con um, condensing of that um whatever alcohol you have in there and you have this trail of condensed alcohol all along there. All right. Uh, um, and so you guys can check out a video. I'll give you guys the link here below. You can see that. Okay. So let's try a couple of sample problems and then we'll be done. So let's look at um, polonium-214. And when polonium-214 decays and polonium-214, like I said, is, is extremely dangerous, um, highly, highly toxic material. So when it decays, the emission consists of what? First, it's going to give off two alpha particles. Then, no, so one alpha particle, then two beta particles, and then finally an alpha particle. What is the resulting stable nucleus? So what we want to do is we want to go through all these different decays and see what it turns into, right? And we're going to write down every single one as we go. So polonium, when it gives off an alpha particle, 
two beta particles, and then finally an alpha particle, what's it turn into? So let's go through them step by step. And I want you guys to do this step by step rather than trying to do it all at once. So let's see. <clears throat> um, this is kind of covered up here. But <clears throat> first we have polonium-214. When it undergoes alpha decay, so we're going to give off, so this should be HE here. My picture's a little bit in the way. So you are giving off an alpha particle right here, and you've got polonium right here. So when it gives off an alpha particle, it's going to turn into what? Well, you ask yourself, what plus 2 equals 84? So that's going to be 82. And on the top, what plus 4 equals 214? Well, that's going to be 210. And so 82, element number 82, if you look it up on the periodic table, is lead. So this is going to be lead 210. Well, it turns out that lead 210 itself is not stable, and lead 210 is going to undergo beta decay, all right? And so here we have lead 210 undergoing beta decay. So you're going to write down your beta particle and say, okay, what plus your beta particle or your electron is going to equal your lead 210? Okay, so, so what minus 1 is 81, 82? What minus 1 is 82? Well, 83 minus 1 is 82. So that you should write down an 83 right here, right? And then you have what plus zero is 210? Well, that's going to be 210. So it's going to be 210, 83. Well, let's check it out. Well, if we recall, element number 83 is bismuth. All right. So we're going to put our bismuth right down here. Next, we're going to say the bismuth 210 itself also is not stable and is going to undergo another beta decay. And so we write down our bismuth here, and then we have our beta particle right here. So we do the same thing. What minus 1 is 83? Well, 84, right? 84 minus 1 is 83. So this is going to be 84 down the bottom, and then 210 plus 0 is 210. So it's going to be 84, 210. We already know 84 is what? 84 is polonium. So we are going to reform polonium, but this time it's polonium 210 not polonium-214. We started with polonium-214, and then now we're at polonium-210, and we're almost done. But polonium-210 itself is also not stable. Polonium-210 is going to undergo alpha decay. And so that final alpha particle, we're going to write down here. So here's your alpha. Alpha is a helium nucleus. So helium nucleus, two protons and two neutrons two protons and two neutrons, has a total mass number of four. And to figure out our last particle, we're going to say, what plus two is 84? Well, of course, that's going to be 82 plus two is 84. Last of all, we're going to say, what plus four is 210? Okay, so that's going to be 206 plus four is 210. So this is going to be 206, 84, and two, we already know that, that um, 82 is lead. So it's going to be 206, 82, and then PB, okay? And so I've highlighted this in red to show you guys that this is the final thing it turns into. But I want to make sure you guys go through all four of these steps before you get to that. All right, so we're going to go ahead and end there. And see you guys tomorrow.